It seems like it's been 40 weeks since you got 40 winks. Your back pain, unbearable. Tossing, turning, trying to find that pain-free position. And that's the moment you realize you can't spend another waking moment putting off treatment. The Joint and Spine Center is Cincinnati's leading destination for spine care with a ton of surgical and non-surgical treatments for back pain. So when a moment has the power to change the rest of your life, go to the one place with the power to change it for the better, the Christ Hospital Health Network. This changes everything. The Pound This Podcast is brought to you by the Christ Hospital Health Network. This is the Pound This Podcast, episode 759, Top Ways to Improve Your Gut Health with Registered Dietitian Nicolette Fraza. I want to lose weight, but I don't know how to get started. What should I meal prep every week? How do I get those sweet booty gains? Inspiration for your healthy lifestyle. The Pound This Podcast with Amanda Valentine. Thank you so much for listening to the Pound This Podcast. I'm Amanda Valentine. My guest today is Nick. I see I'm already messing up your name. Nicolette <laughs> Fraza. Is that correct? You got it. Yay. <laughs> and I know that you are, um, you know, a nutrition and wellness coach, a registered dietitian, and you focus on gut health. So I'm excited to really dig into the gut health topic because I feel like gut health is one of those like buzzwords that you hear like, oh, gut health. But what does that really mean? And, you know, what is gut health and what are we looking for? So I, I definitely want to dive into all of that. But before we get into that, I want to talk about you and what your background is and how did you get to a point where you're like, you know what, I want to become an expert in gut health. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it wasn't always that way. Um, I actually originally went to school for mass communications and then was like, had this crisis of like, I don't want to do this anymore. So I switched over to nutrition, um, switched schools, everything, um, became a registered dietitian. And I initially worked in clinical and I actually did that up until a year ago um, while I was also building my business. But I have been a vegetarian since I was five. And so my parents were not vegetarian. Um, so they quickly started diving into like, what do we need to give her? What should meals look like? And as I got older, that became my passion was like figuring out how to put meals together and how to make them taste good. And that really led me into eventually the path of nutrition. I finally was like, oh yeah, I've done this forever and I love it. Like, let's do that. Um, so I do really love plant-based eating. I love helping others do that. And that was what I focused on for a while. Um, and then I have myself have had gut health issues. Really, they started, I mean, off and on for a while, but I really like recognized them probably about 12 or 13 years ago now. And I was getting my master's. I was super stressed, uh, not sleeping a lot, not eating great. And I was told I had IBS. And so they gave me the low FODMAP diet, which we can talk about more later, but okay. I did not find relief. I was not feeling good. And that just led me down, like figuring it out for myself. Like what could I do to make, help myself feel better? So eventually I was like, this makes sense. This is what I'm really into. And I have done it on myself, which does not mean the same translates for everybody. But um, really, that became my passion was helping other women figure out their own gut health issues. So about two years ago, I started my own private practice um, doing that. So it's mostly plant based gut health. Um, and there's so much gray area with that. I don't there's no like all everybody is vegan. We are just really incorporate more plants. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of how I got into the gut health was like my own experiences. And then I was like, wow, there are so many people struggling with their own gut health and in varying degrees. And unfortunately, it gets missed or downplayed in a lot of conventional medicine. I see a lot of women that go to their doctor kind of like I did. And then it's like, oh, you have IBS. And then you're just left in the dark of what, what does that mean? What can I do? Um, and restrictive diets are generally not the answer. So 
Yes, yeah, that was a long-winded answer. Oh no, not at all. I have so many questions. <laughs> I guess, I guess, starting with um, the first thing that comes to mind, of uh, I think a lot of people when you hear plant-based diet or you hear vegan or you hear vegetarian, I think a lot of people have a lot of fear around. I'm not going to get enough protein. I think protein is a huge conversation in there, and then also just thinking of like, oh, am I getting all of these other nutrients that you know I hear that I'm supposed to be getting from animal proteins? And I think people shy away from it, especially if they're trying to build muscle or, or doing all of that, that are, you know, exercising hard of like, oh, I need all these things and I can't get them from a plant-based diet. I'm sure that you hear that all the time. So I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there is a lot more light now on uh, plant-based and I take it as a very, it's, there's so much to it. It's not just like this black and white diet of you eat these foods and you avoid these foods. Um, I really just want to help people incorporate more plants. So there's so much science behind how plants affect your microbiome, um, your gut microbiome, how they decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease, of strokes, of diabetes. So there's a lot of evidence behind plant-based diets. And I think, unfortunately, for decades, it's been, the, the discussion has been around protein and how we don't get enough protein and you need more protein. And, and yes, protein is absolutely important, but there are small amounts of protein in pretty much all foods. So when we focus on getting a variety of different plants, um, especially things like chickpeas and legumes and nut butters and tofu and tempeh and, um, add variety, you really, will get enough protein. So most Americans get like two to three times what is actually the recommendation for protein. So the discussion in my opinion needs to be more so towards fiber and plants. So it has been proven that about 97% of Americans don't get the recommendations for fiber daily because, um, I mean, if you're focusing solely on meat sources, um, there's no fiber in that. So I don't think that, I think that you can be healthy and include meat and fish and dairy and eggs, if that's your choice. Um, I just think that you also have to ensure that you're getting the plants in and maybe that should be the first thing that people are focusing on. Okay. So where are the major sources of fiber that we should be looking towards if we're not getting the levels that we need? So really all plant foods have fiber. Um, but there are obviously better sources and there's two main types of fiber. There's soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. So if you are having, um, gut issues like constipation or diarrhea, you might want to focus on that. Otherwise it's just eating more plants. So like vegetables obviously are going to be high in fiber, especially like green beans and broccoli, um, different uh, types of legumes, beans, really high in fiber, oats, whole grains. So I think that a lot of people, especially on like the protein train, tend to avoid carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are generally high in fiber. So you want to make sure that you are including different carbohydrate sources um, and not be, not be afraid of them because they do come with a lot of different nutrients and the fiber. Um, potatoes, sweet potatoes, the tubers can be really great fruits, berries, um, really high in fiber. So I would say overall, it's not focusing on like one food. It's just like getting in a variety of plants. Okay. Well, it's another question I had from your introduction is talking about how, you know, you've been vegetarian and plant-based for a very long time, but still found yourself with gut health issues, I think that a lot of people would assume like, oh, you're, you're vegetarian, like you're eating really well. Like how could you have gut health issues if you're having this plant focused diet? So how did you find, like, how did that come all together? So I was vegetarian and that does not always mean that you're healthy. So <laughs> I was living a lot in like convenience food, um, a lot of more like the mock meat stuff, um, like just because it was easy, it was a higher protein source. And there's not, no reason to like demonize those, but um, I was eating more like refined carbohydrates. So just like quick, easy meals. I was not focusing necessarily on plants. So um, I was also drinking more alcohol 
And for me, stress was a huge factor that was interfering with my gut. So we know a lot about the gut-brain connection and how stress completely can mess with your digestion. Um, so there was a lot of stress in school. My mom was sick um, and I did not handle stress well. So for me, I found that to be a huge factor in my gut issues. So, well, I want to come back to that. Definitely. I think we're all under an insane amount of stress and I think that, <laughs> that is a huge topic. Yeah. So uh, put a pin in that, but first <laughs> you brought up the, the low FODMAP diet and, mm -hmm. and let's talk about what that is. Cause I think that's something else that kind of, you know, you see here and there and people are like, well, what the heck is that? And it doesn't, it doesn't have an understanding of that. So, so what is that and how did that work in your situation? So the low FODMAP diet is a tool uh, for IBS management. So it is it stands for um, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols, which are short chain carbohydrates that can be poorly absorbed in the small intestine by people with IBS. So IBS is not something that you can really diagnose based on testing. It's more so just a it's um, a disease or a situation of exclusion. So you are ruling out other things. So you rule out like IBD, um, celiac, and then it's just a collection of symptoms. So um, it could be a gut brain dysfunction. Um, but there are a lot of studies showing that the low FODMAP diet can be helpful for people with IBS to manage symptoms. It, however, does not address the root causes of your IBS. So this is where I see people get stuck a lot because uh, maybe their doctor gave them a handout on the low FODMAP diet. And so they go home and they do it. They exclude all of those carbohydrates. So it's a very lengthy list of foods that are high in FODMAPs. So you exclude all of these foods and you maybe feel better for a while but then what happens is uh, they stay stuck on this diet. And over time, it actually can make your gut weaker because these foods are high in prebiotics, they're high in fibers, and you're essentially starving a lot of your good gut bacteria. So in the long term, it can make your symptoms worse. Um, so it's meant to be a diet of like four to six weeks and you cut them out and then you slowly add them back in and try to find what might, might be the more problematic foods. And I, in my practice, I use this uh, rather sparingly. So I do use it sometimes as like a last resort or while we are working on the root causes to help people just feel better in the interim. So it can help you, it can calm the inflammation, calm your symptoms while we're really digging in to figure out like, why are you having the bloating? Why are you constipated? Um, because Usually it's not just, it's not the food. It's more so like the environment that the food is going into. Okay. So what would yeah. you say, um, you know, in your personal experience and with all of the patients that you've worked with and, and just in general being studying this for so long, like what are the main symptoms that you see that are linked to gut health issues? So I, for, well, I see most most often bloating, constipation, diarrhea, reflux. Um, those are the big ones that I see. And oftentimes they have been to the doctor and ruled out um, to not have like, I always say like that is the most important thing first is to have things ruled out. So we know that you don't have um, ulcerative colitis or celiac disease. And then we can really get digging to find out like what is causing these symptoms. Okay. So what about, I mean, I'm sure I'm just like a total, you've dealt with people like me before where <laughs> I'm like, I'll eat foods and I'll get really bloated. Like I just like, you can see it. Like I like just tight balloon distended belly in pain. And I'm like, Oh, it's probably because I ate too much cheese. And I'm like, well, whatever. I'm still going to keep eating cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I understand certain foods make me feel this way and I feel terrible doing, but yet I won't stop doing it. <laughs> and that's your choice, right? Yeah. I think, I think it's all what your, what your level of comfort, like comfortability is with it. Is that a word? Comfortability? Oh, it, it is now. <laughs> how, com how comfortable you yeah. are. With it. Um, 
Cause you're the, it's your body and you're in control of it. So you get to choose. And as long as it's not doing any physical harm to your body, then I would say eat it and enjoy it. And if that is the reasoning, then, um, then that's up to you. But I also think, um, sometimes it goes beyond just oftentimes it goes just beyond the actual food. So we're so quick to cut out foods, but really looking at like, what was the environment that you ate it? Were you stressed out? Mm. Were you in your car? Uh, did you actually chew it? Do you like remember what you ate? Oftentimes people just like gobble food down and have no idea what they even ate. Um, was it, did you have something that was carbonated? Um, so there's so many of the, like how you're eating, I think that contributes to how you digest the food even more sometimes than the food itself. Oh yeah. See, that's a, such an important point because I, I didn't even consider eating in the car was going to affect how my body reacts to food. Like why, why does that make a difference? Is it just add a level of stress? It could be stress. So when we are not really mindfully eating, so backing up of like how digestion works. So when most of us live in what's called like the sympathetic or the fight or flight, mm -hmm. right? So we're always on the go. Even if you don't recognize like a source of stress, like let's say a traffic jam or work stress, there's always underlying stress for everybody, right? So if you are eating in the sympathetic mode, um, you're in the fight or flight. So you're your body is redirecting blood from your digestive tract to your arms and your legs so that you can run or fight so that you're ready, like ready to do anything. Um, it also is hindering your body from releasing digestive juices. So something like hydrochloric acid or um, pancreatic enzymes. So those may be hindered. So you, first of all, you don't have the blood flow to your digestive tract, and then you're not re releasing enough digestive juices. So if you eat in this state, um, you're just not going to digest and absorb your food as well. Likely, um, if you are in the car, you're probably not properly chewing. Um, you're not paying attention to how the food tastes, how your body is reacting to it. If you feel full, so those like check-ins of actually like how the body feel, how the food feels in your body. So it's kind of just like we often think, I think of meals as another thing to check off our to-do list. Like if we can do it while doing something else, even better. Mm -hmm. Like if I can eat while I'm writing up my report, then like, cool, I killed two birds with one stone, but really there, you might have some digestive issues down the line because you weren't paying attention. So what about, I mean, and I'm so, I'm so guilty of this as much as I care about health and wellness. I'm just like, so purely guilty of everything that I, I, you know, I, I feel like my life, I don't know if there's one minute where I'm not in fight or flight. Like, I just feel like it's intense stress all the time. And I know so many other people feel that way. So is there even any chance for my body to have any correct digestion or is my gut health just completely like off the charts haywire because I can't get out of this nonstop stressful state? Well, so it takes some work on your habits, right? And trying yeah. to ease into that parasympathetic, the rest and digest mode. So it could be as simple as you just start taking like six deep breaths before meals and okay. that will help switch your body over. Um, that is usually what I do as a first step with clients is just like pause and do some deep breathing and that will help bring your body into the rest and digest. Um, also really looking at your food and smelling it and trying to like just register what you're about to eat and that can help start the, pro the process of digestion so that we produce saliva which is the first step in breaking down um, carbohydrates. So if you are taking the time to actually register that you're about to eat, you can produce saliva, which then it has a downstream effect of like telling your, your stomach that food's about to come. So it can release hydrochloric acid. So it's kind of this downstream effect of the digestion starting in your mouth. So if you can just take the time to look at it, um, register it, your brain can tell your body that it's about to, about to eat. Okay. So, so for you personally of working through all of this and helping others through it, like what is your day of eating kind of look like? So I don't like to get specific with the, like what I eat, because I feel like that can be I not agree. good role. Like I don't yeah. like to, yeah, comparison. Um, but generally I 
eat breakfast within an hour of waking up. So within one to two hours can be really helpful, especially for women, for our hormones and circadian rhythms. So um, I usually eat oatmeal and berries and flaxseed. I right now, once it starts getting warmer, I'll probably switch to a smoothie. I really like smoothies. Um, and if you do smoothies, I would say always chew them um, because that will also help with the process of digestion. How do you chew a smoothie? You just chew. <laughs> you just chew. <laughs> It's um, so I, I, for this reason, I actually do a lot of smoothie bowls where I put okay. like, fruit or granola on top because then it like forces you to chew. Gotcha. But otherwise just chewing, it doesn't feel normal, but yeah, you can chew a smoothie and just the act of like chewing will help your body register that it's a meal and not just like a beverage that gotcha. you're consuming. And that will help with satiety as well, just to feel full from it a little bit longer. Um, and then I usually, the next meal would be lunch. I eat a lot of legumes, a lot of beans. I do like a lot of, um, bootables. We do like a grain and some, either like some tofu or legumes, a lot of veggies, like a ton of veggies. I do a lot of roasted veggies. Um, but we also like, I have two kids. We also eat pizza and like it's not all just cookie cutter meals. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of flexibility with it. And I think that that is what eating, you know, eating like quote unquote healthily should be. It's like a flexible level of eating and not just like the rigidity around like I read that you have to have um, so many servings of this a day and this a day. But you also, I think that there is a lot of importance around enjoying your food and also, the other component, not just the nutrition of food, which is important, but also it's a sociable thing and a cultural. And there's so many other aspects of food that I think are important. And um, going back to like that low FODMAP diet, for example, if, it, if you're following this one diet and it is stressing you out, that in itself could cause the digestive issues. So I think sometimes the stress around food can be worse than the actual food itself. Yeah. Well, I, it's funny. I just um, did a trip with a friend who, and I'm just curious since you're so, you know, plant-based focused, who has a lot of these gut health issues, IBS issues, a lot of like, yeah, a lot of sensitivities to a lots of foods. And she has found what has worked best for her is doing like the carnivore diet of just mm -hmm. doing the opposite end of just eating all the meat and leaving everything else out. And she feels like that's personally given her some relief from some of that. Like, what are your thoughts on, on that end of the spectrum? Mm. So not a fan of the carnivore diet. <laughs> so the reason that people can find some symptom relief is because you're literally not eating anything that is feeding your good gut bacteria. So you're just not involving them in the process at all. So eventually they will starve and will die off, which does make your microbiome, your gut microbiome weaker. So that is where now if she tries to reintroduce uh, a bunch of fiber rich foods, she doesn't have, she doesn't have like the army to be able to handle that because um, they have been starved, but it doesn't mean like she can never again, but that is where people, when they start to reintroduce, like, let's say she had a craving for an apple and she went, she decided to eat it and she's most likely going to feel like bloating, indigestion, not good because the bacteria that like to eat those food, that, that food and break it down is just not present anymore. So it's going to produce symptoms. So, and that's, and that's why a lot of times people will then avoid those foods because if foods make you not feel great, you just cut them out. But it be can become this cycle of just cutting out more and more foods. But in the meantime, it's also weakening your gut microbiome so that you it's going to be more difficult to diversify your diet eventually. So how do we improve our gut health? I mean, even if we're not having symptoms like the, the bloating and, and, you know, constipation or IBS and, uh, and all of that of, you know, what are those kind of foods that we're going to build things up that are going to help everything along? Like, I guess just, in, I mean, it's such a generalized question and said to be like, tell me how to improve it all. But I guess, you know, I obviously stress reduction is one of those, but like what kind of foods should we be doing? What kind of activities should we be doing just to kind of make sure that, 
you know, our gut is in check. Cause it sounds like that's kind of running everything. Yeah. So there, I, there is so much that is affected by your gut. So I know I mentioned, like, I see people a lot for like bloating and indigestion, but it's also anxiety. Your mood is affected a lot by your gut health, skin issues, um, hormones, your liver. So really it is all there. Most of your body is connected to the state of your gut. So even if you're not having direct gut health issues, I would say there's so much you can do to improve it that will affect so many other issues in your body. So first, I would say trying to diversify your plant sources. So um, studies have shown that 30 different types of plants a week can be the greatest predictor of your gut health. So when I say plants, it's not just vegetables, it's vegetables, fruits, herbs, grains, beans, nuts, So there's a lot that can go into that. So let's say um, for breakfast, you have oats. That's one uh, plant. And then you could add berries. If you do three different types of berries, that's three different types of plants. And then maybe some flax seeds. Um, So right there, that could be five plant sources. So 30 in a week isn't super difficult to get to. It's just paying attention and trying not to eat the same exact thing every day. So like when you see people meal plan and they have like a quote unquote healthy meal of chicken and brown rice and broccoli, that's fine. But if you eat that every single day, you're really limiting how many plants you're getting. Um, Yeah. So that would be one tip is really diversifying up your plants. And then second would be the mindful eating, I would say. And just one thing is just chewing your food. Most people take like three chews and then swallow it down onto the next. Sometimes you put food in your mouth when there's already food there. So really taking the time to chew each bite thoroughly. Your stomach doesn't have teeth. So if you're not completely breaking down the food in your mouth, it's just going to be that extra work for your gut. Um, And it also helps you just to register your hunger in fullness and what's going on with that. If you can take the time to chew completely and just slow down. Um, And then a third tip would be looking at your hydration. So it's tough for a lot of people to drink enough water. I would say it's a good starting point. The goal should be like 64 ounces a day of fluid. Um, And so like reusable water bottles, I have, I also have a lot of clients use apps that like tell them when to drink water Mm -hmm. during the day. And people find that helpful. It's just like, sometimes you don't take the time to even stop and notice if you're thirsty or you don't want to like go fill up your water bottle. Um, But really that reminder can be enough. So upping water intake, or at least like ensuring that you're getting enough. Um, Movement wise, I would say any kind of like movement that feels good for you that you're going to keep doing is going to be the most important. So if you are having significant gut issues, I would say backing off of high intensity because that can put more stress on your body. So, um, but for the average person, just getting in movement, it could be walking, it could be yoga, it could be gardening. Um, but really just moving your body and that will help with, that will aid with digestion and also, it does um, promote beneficial bacteria in your gut as well. A couple questions. One is, so yeah. if I'm putting, like I have right next to me a, a large bottle of water that I put lemon, like just squo- mm-hmm. like squoze, I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> yeah, whatever, you know what I mean. Sure. I put some fresh lemon juice in and does that count as one of my plants by putting lemon juice in my water? Sure. Cool. (laughs) And and two is I think that also when we think, you know, get into gut health conversations, people think about taking a probiotic or eating a Mm -hmm. yogurt, eating sauerkraut, some fermented foods some like kimchi, those sorts of things or kefir or anything like that. Like, would you recommend putting those sorts of things into your diet or is that not necessarily a, a major player in this conversation? Yeah. Fermented foods are great. I love them. I would say if you can tolerate them and feel okay with them, then I would say including, so the issue is more so including small amounts, um, more frequently. So you don't want to just have like one cup of sauerkraut one day and then that's it for your month. Um, so like, even if it's like a couple forkfuls every, every other day. And so the issue with, um, probiotics. So there are live active cultures in fermented food as well, the probiotics, but um, 
they are more so just visitors in your gut. So they do not take residence. So you're eating these good bacteria, but they're not necessarily going to stay in your gut microbiome. So it's more important to eat them more consistently so that they can do the work as they're going through and help boost your good bacteria um, and help aid in digestion, but then they're not necessarily going to stay there. So as long as you're eating them more often, they, you'll have the, the beneficial health um, outcomes. Okay. <laughs> there you go. And what are your thoughts too on, you know, I've heard so much of this is like healing your leaky gut and helping, you know, your microbiome is like bone broth and collagen. And I know that's more animal based. Like what are your feelings on those sorts of things? Yeah. So I think that they have a place if you want to include them. I think that there are also options for plant-based eaters. Um, I think there's not a ton of scientific data behind them, but I think that there's enough like anecdotal that they can be helpful. And if I, I, I think the power of your thoughts are so important that like, if you feel like it's helping you, if you're doing it and it seems like it's beneficial, then yeah, totally keep doing it. Um, collagen is just an, it's an amino acid. Um, but you can also get it in many other sources. You can help your body, um, to make more collagen, which can be beneficial. And I think overall, it's just getting like your protein in. I don't think necessarily. So when we eat protein, it's broken down into amino acids and stored in our body. And then when our body needs a certain type, it puts the amino acids back together in a configuration that it needs at that moment. So it's not necessarily saying a collagen is just a form of amino acid. So that may not be used for what we think it is. It may just be stored and then put back together for whatever our body needs. So our body is usually pretty smart and knows like how to take care of you with the right, under the right condition. So I think as long as you're eating a variety of different proteins, I think your body will know what to do with it. But bone broth can be really nice to just like calm inflammation. So it's an easy, um, it's broken down and your body can really just absorb it pretty easily. So it can be a good option. It doesn't, I don't think it has to be though in your gut healing process. Okay. Well, the same thing. I, I've heard a lot about, you know, gut healing through extended fasting. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts on that? So I have used, there's something called like an elemental diet, which is, um, really just drinking and that can be used sometimes for like SIBO, which is like a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth where we're trying to kill like the bacteria that's in the wrong place. And I, it can be helpful then that's not fasting. You're still eating every day. Um, I don't ever really recommend an extended period of fasting. I think maybe if you did it, if you wanted to do it for a day to calm inflammation, slow things down, um, that could be helpful, but I wouldn't recommend it. Long okay. Term. And then I, I'm just firing all these random questions at you. <laughs> I don't know if, it, if it's, it, you know, got into your sphere or not over the past, I guess probably six months, maybe like last summer was such a huge TikTok trend where everybody's like, I am take, everybody was taking those dewormers. Did you see all of that? Where oh. people were taking dewormers because they're like, oh, there's worms in my gut and they're taking like this like heart guard that like dogs take or like oh. these like horse dewormers and then doing all these TikToks of like, oh man, yeah. And I mean, I went to the bathroom. I didn't realize I had worms and I've got worms. <laughs> so oh, no. I, yeah, I didn't know if you saw all of that or they're just like, oh, I was having all these gut issues. And, you know, and I mean, obviously I wouldn't take any sort of medical advice from TikTok, but I, I definitely know that was a, a thing for a minute. And actually um, at the gym that, that I work at, I had some clients tell me that they saw a nutritionist who recommended doing some of those things. And that felt very incorrect. <laughs> yeah, that's worrisome for yeah, sure. Yeah, right? <laughs> so um, I didn't know if that yeah. had touched your sphere or not at all, if you saw any of that. I haven't. Um, so I do, with some of my clients, we do a functional stool test. And if you have worms, it would show up on there um, or a parasite. But I don't think that it, I, I mean, I have run dozens of functional stool tests and I have only seen a parasite once. Um, I have not seen worms. So I don't think everybody is running around with worms in them. So <laughs> if anything, um, 
I would worry what it's doing to you to take these things that are supposedly killing worms. It's, I mean, it sounds like it's probably giving people diarrhea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound pleasant, but uh, no, I, I have not seen that. Yeah. The internet's wild. <laughs> <laughs> So with, with your clients and you have a private practice and I know that you work virtually with a lot of people like, so, and if somebody listening to this, like who, you know, who are you kind of like looking to coach of like what, like the most patients and clients that you have, uh, you know, what are they feeling? What are they looking for? How do you help them? What does that process look like? So really anyone that would say you're having like any kind of digestive issues. So like I said, the most common would be bloating and this could be bloating daily. It could be just bloating most of, you know, whatever that looks like for you, if it's disruptive to your life and you want to figure out why, um, that would make sense. Any kind of like issues with constipation, diarrhea, reflux. So really anything going on if with your digestive tract, if you have been told that you have IBS, um, so we can dig deeper really to figure out what's going on with that. I also work with clients just to go plant-based or to make sure that like what you're eating is adequate and nutritious on a plant-based diet. So that is like another subset that I like to work with. Um, but it also could just be like, you want to improve your gut health or know how to prevent chronic issues um, down the line by improving your gut health. So even if you're not having significant issues and you just want to like improve it. So sometimes I have had clients work with me just because they have like anxiety and want to see if like working on the gut brain connection, improving their gut health can help with that as well. Awesome. Well, I do want to go to, cause I, I just had somebody ask me this question just a few days ago um, because there are so many, speaking of the internet, like health coaches and, and quote unquote experts uh, on Instagram and TikTok and everything else. So, so why is it different working with you being a registered dietitian? How is that different from somebody with just the label health coach? So I have, obviously I've, I went to, I got my bachelor's in nutrition and food sciences, and then I had to do a very extensive internship, um, for a year where, it was um, clinical. We also worked on, um, it was, it was very in depth. I also um, have a master's in science in food and nutrition. So I know how I have learned a lot about how the body works at like a mechanical level and the ins and outs of it. I think right now on social media there, especially in gut health, it's just like it, like you said, it's this buzz. And I think focusing just on gut health you could be missing a lot because we're not just like one specific body part, right? We're an entire person and everything works together. So knowing how everything is connected and being able to troubleshoot other things that could be going on, I think is really important. And I also rely heavily on the science. So um, looking at studies and why I recommend things, um, not just, you know, because it's cool and I get paid to promote certain things. So yeah. I think the internet can be, it's wonderful. I think it's so great that like this information is accessible to people. Um, but it's also, it can be a little frightening, like what can be put out there without any evidence. Definitely. So, well, speaking of the internet, <laughs> if somebody is looking to connect with you and they've heard this conversation and they're like, wow, this is really resonating with me. Uh, I do want to, you know, work on some gut health issues or anxiety or everything that, that you named or bloating, uh, you know, how do they contact you? What does that process look like? Do you do like a, a consultation? Uh, what, what are all the things? Yeah. So uh, Instagram is probably the best place to reach out to me. So my name is Nicolette Fraza underscore nutrition, and you can message me there. I have an application in my bio, and you, if you apply there, we can set up a free consultation call, go through what's going on with you, what it would look together working, uh, what, what, what it would look like to work together, any questions that you have. Um, I do work, I work one-on-one -on -one with clients. I also have a group program, and that is we focus a lot on the foundations of gut healing and, and gut health in general, but then there is optional stool testing available with that. So that is where we can really individualize it and see 
what is going on with you. If you have feel like you've tried all of the foundational stuff and you're still having issues, we might just have to dig a little bit deeper. So I do offer the functional stool testing with either group program or one-on-one, but yeah, that would be the best place. Instagram. I also have a website, nicolettefraza.com. Awesome, Nicolette. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. This was so great and so informative, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. AmandaValentineBites.com.